did uh, you guys get this when you came in? Hopefully you did. Um, if not, you can grab one there at the back table there. Might be helpful for you to follow along this morning and fill in the blanks. So I looked up this morning, what is the number one disease uh, that is killing humans at the moment? And it is cardiovascular disease. It is um, heart disease, as far as I can understand. It looks like upwards of about 10 million uh, people um, in, in the room. Maybe that's outdated, but, but from what I could tell, that's the primary disease. And what happens there, and I'm not... I know there's some medical professionals in here, so uh, forgive me. I'm not a medical professional, but from what I understand, um, what happens is your your arteries begin to um, become clogged. And uh, Ben, just like give me evil eye if I'm wrong here. Okay, your artery just begins to get clogged, right? And with with what they call plaque, and over time, the blood flow to the heart begins to become restricted and limited, which can lead to, I believe, a heart attack. So it's important that we have healthy hearts. It's important, and a lot of us you know, probably exercise and eat certain ways, trying to think about our healthy hearts. Um, But in fact, heart disease uh, physically is not the greatest disease of mankind. The greatest disease of mankind is actually spiritual heart disease. Okay, spiritual heart disease is when our heart is not receiving the blood flow of the grace of God via Jesus Christ, faith in him. Uh, When we begin to develop clogged arteries, so to speak. We aren't receiving any more God's grace. We're thinking too much about what we're producing rather than what we're receiving. And that really is the proclivity for us as humans, isn't it? To spend all our time thinking about what we're producing for God rather than what we're receiving from God. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a, a rut that I, I just impossibly or constantly trying to get out of. I wake up thinking about what I'm doing for God. I don't wake up naturally thinking about what I need to be receiving from God. And so my, my theory, and I think this is consistent with the Bible, is that in order to have um, a healthy heart with the Lord, we have to constantly be receiving his grace. We have to constantly be figuring out what is blocking me from receiving the grace of God. And I'm not talking about receiving the grace of God just in salvation. I'm talking about receiving the grace of God every day, because that is the Christian life. The Christian life is wake up and receive the grace of God again. The mercies of God are new every day. And not just when you sin and not just because you did something wrong, but but literally for life. Like we as Christians should be living out of grace constantly. We think of grace as just something that gets us into the kingdom of God, but grace is something that really permeates the whole life of the believer. Grace is something that supplies all that we have and all that we need directly from God. Israel, the Jews, in, in the time that Paul was writing this letter, had some serious heart disease going on. And the reason I bring up the heart, by the way, if you remember last week back in, uh, I think it was verse, uh, chapter two, verse uh, 29, Paul told us that a Jew, meaning one who is a child of God, someone in the covenant community of God, is not one because of their ethnicity, but rather what? A Jew is one because of their heart, because they have this circumcised heart, meaning they are one because they've had put their faith and trust in God. That's what makes you truly in covenant with God. It's by faith alone. And the Jews had really missed, uh, they had really lost sight of that. They had developed, I think, what was some, some unhealthy uh, cardiovascular disease, if you will. They'd, they'd uh, developed this inability to really see just how much grace God had shown them. They started to kind of calcify and they started to take uh, for granted and maybe even uh, become entitled to all of the goodness that God had shown them as a people. And so this, was a, this is a real problem, a real problem that Paul is trying to speak against in his presentation of the gospel. Uh, you know, the first, um, probably the most perverted thought that we could have is to think that God is on trial and that we are his judge. That's probably the most perverted thought that we could entertain or allow. And, and that's probably... And when I say God, I don't just mean the generic, squishy idea of God. I mean the God of the Bible. And when I interact with many um, non-Christians, they they tend to um, feel as though the God of the Bible is on trial and that they are the judge. And they say things like, I don't think I can believe in a God that does this or this or this. And that's the presupposition. And that's 
That's the, the thinking of our day. I think there was another time where people had a really hard time understanding how God could be gracious. In our day, people have a really hard under, time understanding how God could be judge, judgmental. You know, how could God judge anybody? That's the thing people have a hard time with. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I think the people that are the quickest to put God on trial is particular, are t- particularly the people that are the most religious. Okay? Who, who crucified Jesus? Yeah, you could say the Romans physically did it, but who was behind it? It was the Pharisees, right? The most religious. Uh, so I, I think that the, the, the most, and by the way, I should, I should define my terms. When I say religious, I'm not talking about uh, born-again, authentic, Christ-believing Christians. When I say religious, and I think you know what I mean by this, I, I'm saying those who feel that they are square with God because of something they've done, because of something maybe they didn't do, because of something they know, or because of who they associate with. That's religion, false religion. And at its core is a self-righteousness. I am okay with God because of what I have done for God, because of what I bring to the table. That's self-righteousness. That's the, and that was the operating system of the Jews, and that's the operating system of most religious people um, in our culture. And don't, don't believe for a second, this is a side note, but don't believe for a second that secular humanism isn't a religion in our culture. It is. And they have their own way of being square with their idea of God. And it usually has to do with their own sense of of morality and virtue signaling. Now, I bring this up because I think the more religious you are in the negative sense, the more that you begin to judge God when he doesn't do things the way that you think he should do them. Okay? Uh, And the reason is because you think you earn something. And God says, actually, I just like to give things. And all of a sudden you go, but that's not fair. Let me give you an example that I know you're familiar with. Jesus gave the story of the prodigal son. But what do we know about the story of the prodigal son? It's actually not the story of the prodigal son. Go read it. It's a story about a prodigal son, and it's a story about another son, the self-righteous son. See, one of the, one of the sons took the inheritance of the father, and he went off and he squandered it to the point where he was living with the pigs, and then he came back uh, basically on his knees just asking if the father would let him even be a servant And the father just shows this this radical grace to the son. And that kind of tends to be the focus of the the story. But when you really look at it more closely, there's this other part of the story. There's another son. And the other son is infuriated by this radical grace that the father shows to the prodigal. Why is he infuriated? Because he really loves himself. (laughs) He doesn't love the father's love for him. He doesn't love his brother. He really loves himself. And he feels like, but I didn't go and waste my father's money. Where's my party? Where's my, where's my rewards? See, that's the religious mindset. The religious mindset looks at what God does and what God gives. And it goes, well, wait a minute. I did this stuff. You should give me more than you gave that person. Now, why did Jesus tell that parable? I actually think it was to illustrate exactly what Paul's trying to draw out for us today, and that is that the older son was Israel, the the religious apostate Israel, self-righteous Israel, those that looked at the Gentiles and they went, God, it's unfair that you would choose these guys and make them equal with us when we are your people. We're the ones that have the pedigree. We're the ones that have all of this time been following you, right? There's this kind of, this, 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 Feeling that God is unjust because God shows grace. This is what, listen to me, this is what grace does to people that are self-righteously religious. It scandalizes them. Because they think, wait a minute, that's not fair. God must not be fair. And so Paul is going to try to work through some of this stuff. You know, the the same thing is what Jesus is trying to put his finger on when he talks about the parable of the, the person that hired different workers to come work in his field. Remember that? Hires one guy, and he works all day, and then he hires another guy a couple hours later, and then he hires another guy a couple, a couple hours later. Hires the last guy just a few hours before closing time, and then at the end of the day, he pays them all the same. And the guys that are there all day, they're going, what the heck? You're not, you're not a good, you're, 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 you're not fair. We should get paid more. And he said, wait a minute, I paid you what I told you you were due. The problem isn't the fairness of the owner. The problem is the graciousness of the owner and how that interfaces with people when they feel like they deserve something. So that's kind of what Jesus was trying to to tease out about the, the operating system of Israel. They felt like they were owed something. And the inclusion of the Gentiles through this radical grace of Jesus was frankly insulting to them for the same reason that it would be insulting to someone if I was led into Harvard. 
They'd be like, don't let that guy in. You're bringing down the value of my degree. Like if you let this guy in, then all of a sudden they're thinking, well, if he's in, then everyone else that has a degree must not be. So, so there's a reason that schools, these Ivy League schools are very selective about who they let in because if they let just anybody in, it lowers the value of their product. It makes it less prestigious. So the Jews are looking at this gospel that people like Paul are preaching about God's radical grace through Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, to the outcasts, to the outsiders. And they're going, you're lowering the property value of our position. You're making it look like just anybody can come into this thing without the pedigree, without the background, without the circumcision. What, what's going on with that? And so Paul, everywhere he went, he would preach the gospel and the gospel looked like something like Romans. You know that? It looked exa almost exactly like Romans. And he would start by showing how the Gentiles were uh, totally God rejectors. And the Jews would go, that's right. And then Paul would start to get more narrow and he would go, and so are the Jews. Everyone is ultimately in need of grace. And all of a sudden you could feel the tension in the room. And the Jews would start to throw hands up in the air and they would start to ask questions and say, how, how could you say that about, I mean, God created Judaism. God created Jewishness. You think God is unrighteous? You think God's not good for doing this? If, if, if God lets these kind of people into the kingdom, then isn't he promoting evil? Well, if God is all about the Gentiles now and the Gentiles can be part of the Jews because of their faith, then doesn't that mean that the Jews really ultimately aren't even the Jews anymore? Paul, you're, 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 Kooky dukes, man. Like, you're, you're crazy, Paul. And then they beat him up and try to kill him. And the reason they beat him up and try to kill him was because he was challenging their pedigree, see? He was challenging the value of their document that said, I went to this school. <laughs> By diluting it with this Gentile blood. They had a real hard time with this. And so you might step back and you might look at the material we're going to cover here in a moment. And you might go, Paul, why are you just going on and on about the Jews here? And the answer is because Paul is trying to, to undo, to deconstruct this wrong thinking that the Jews had developed. And that was that they were chosen by God because of some kind of merit that they had. That they were God's favorite because of what they brought to the table. That God liked them better because they were more likable. He's trying to undo that. He's trying to go, no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with anything you've done, anything you can do, anything you know, anything you say, any, anywhere you live, anyone you're born of. It has nothing to do with any of that. It just has everything to do with the grace of God. God chose Abraham when he was a nobody, and he made him somebody because of his grace. And all of us are on equal footing in that exact same place. But when that kind of radical grace interacts with self-righteous religion, it just is incompatible. And frankly, people get really mad about it. People get really mad about that kind of grace. So what we're going to see here this morning is we're going to see Paul interfacing with the kind of accusations that he would have got in the synagogues when he was preaching the gospel. He anticipates him. Because remember, Paul's been preaching for 20, 25 years now. He's been preaching the gospel everywhere he goes. And, and yes, he went into Gentile cities primarily. But remember, he would go into the synagogues first. And he, because the, the Jews had the foundation of the Bible. They, they had the Old Testament in their laps. They understood the covenants. Now, they, they misunderstood uh, that it was all pointed to Jesus, and that's why he was there to give them the gospel. But he would go into the synagogues, and he would present this gospel, mostly to Jews, and, and they would have these, these sort of core uh, reactions to his gospel, and, and Paul knew what they were. And if you do any kind of a, a apologetics or, or evangelism for any period of time, you start to realize that people really do only have a few, a handful of things that they really object to. And they usually will ask those questions. So you can usually kind of figure out how to answer them. Um, it's, it's, it's not often that you get a, a unique or new question about the Bible or about the gospel. You know, uh, so, so Paul knows. And so what you're going to see as we <clears throat> dive into this text, you're going to see Paul bringing these things up and then he's going to answer them. Uh, not as thoroughly as I would prefer that he answers them, but he answers them more later in the book of Romans. So we're not going to spend too much time on that, but we want to see what was the objection of the Jews? What was the objection of the self-righteous Jews to this good news of the radical grace of God poured out through his son, Jesus Christ? What was their objection to the gospel or what were their objections to the gospel? And what Paul is trying to do here is he's trying to level the playing field. I heard a good example this week, one pastor gave of this. He's saying, you know, if somebody was trying to swim the English Channel and, and, and one person, you know, made it two miles and drowned and then the other person made it six miles and drowned and then another person made it 12 miles and drowned, 
they all drowned. <laughs> Okay, no, none, of them, none of them made it. And, and so maybe Israel was shown more favor or was given more revelation or was given more knowledge by God. But at the end of the day, everybody's drowned. Ephesians 2, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, which means everybody needs the grace of God equally. And no amount of good works that you do in your life makes you any more deserving or any closer to swimming the channel. There is no way across the channel other than Christ. So Paul's just trying to systematically level the room and say, look, everybody, Jew, Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised, knowing the word, not knowing the word, there's only one way to be made righteous, and that is to have your heart have a posture of faith before God, to put your faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone, to receive his gift of righteousness in exchange for your filthy rags of your righteousness. And that's the very, the very, very center of the atonement, the very center of the gospel. So this is where Paul's been leading us, and today's kind of the wrap-up on what's really kind of what feels like the depressing section of the first part of Romans, where Paul's just kind of like talking about how bad humans are over and over and over again. He's going to kind of conclude this and land that this week, and then that's going to set him up to begin to give the good news of how God is saving humanity from sin. So that's kind of where we are. Let me give, let me give you the outline, and uh, we can work through it. Hopefully rather quickly, since there's a lot of text. I spent way too long on that introduction. Um, Let me give you the three main parts of our text. So we're going to look at Romans 3, 1 through 20, and it breaks into three sections. You can write them in if you'd like. The first section is Paul's rhetorical dialogue, anticipating their accusations. Paul's rhetorical dialogue, anticipating their accusations. And that's verse 1 through 8. Spend most of our time there. And then we're going to see Paul's scriptural text proving their condemnation. And that's verses 9 through 18. And then just uh, the last couple verses here, we'll see Paul's summational point concluding his assertion. So Paul's rhetorical dialogue, anticipating their accusations. Paul's scriptural text proving their condemnation. And Paul's summational point concluding his assertion. This is some hard Bible here, okay? So buckle up. Uh, I had to really wrestle with this this week and try to understand what Paul is getting at here, and hopefully we, we, we can get our hands around the edges of it. But let's just dive right in. First, Paul's rhetorical dialogue, anticipating their accusation. So again, as I've already said, Paul knows what kind of questions these uh, self-righteous Jews are going to ask, and in case there's any in the church at Rome or any that might read this letter, he wants to get ahead of it, and he wants to say what he would say if they asked him the question. Because he's not there. So it's almost like he's populating a Q&A right into his sermon in advance. Uh, this is called diatribe or, or discourse. It was a very common form of literature in that day. A very form, uh, common form of, of monologue uh, was to ask yourself a question and then answer it. Paul does it all the time and he does it a lot here. So here's the, the, the questions Paul's going to ask. He's going to ask three questions. The first one, he's going to say, what about our Jewishness? This is the first question he's going to anticipate them asking. What about our Jewishness? Look at verse 1 then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Now again, this is Paul asking the question that he knows they would ask him. What, what advantage is the Jew? Here's my paraphrase of this in verse one. My paraphrase is this. God pioneered the Jews, so was he misguided in doing so? Because see, Paul has literally been saying, yeah, your Jewishness counts for nothing in terms of salvation. In fact, if you're circumcised physically, but your heart's not right with God, you're a Gentile. If you're a Gentile, uncircumcised, but your heart's right with God, then you're a Jew, (laughs) right? And and so the the immediate reaction of the Jewish audience would be, wait a minute. So are you saying that God made a mistake when he created Jewishness? When he called Abraham, when he created the Mosaic Covenant? Like, are you saying God was mistaken in that? Because... Clearly, there's got to be some kind of advantage or God never would have called them. Now, listen to Paul's answer. He says in verse 2, much in every way to begin with. Now, this is so classic, Paul. He says to begin with as though he's going to give a list, but he never gives the list. He just gives one thing, which I don't know if he got distracted or what. I don't know. Um, You know, the, the Holy Spirit speaking through the human author here, okay? But he says much in every way to begin with. He gives one reason. The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Or the word of God. It's logia. It's the word of God. So what he's saying here is he's saying, no, there's no advantage to being a Jew in terms of salvation. But there is great advantage to being a Jew in terms of revelation. 
because God chose Israel to be his host in order to, to bring his witness onto the world. God chose Israel to be uh, primarily the beacon of light, to show the grace of God to the lost and dying world. And, and just, but that has nothing to do with them being saved. It has everything to do with them being used by God. So there's great benefit in being a Jew. There's still great benefit in being a Jew. He said the, the, the Jews were the ones that got to have the, the oracles of God. The word of God came through these guys. Now, we have to, I just, this is, goes without saying, I gotta say it again, we're not saved by what we know, we're not saved by what we do, we're saved by who we trust, okay? Now, now I, I resonate with this a little bit because I don't know about you guys, but I was raised in the church. And being raised in the church sometimes feels like a, a value add, sometimes it feels like a deficit, depending on your experience. And, and I think you could very much say, well, if being in the church and being raised in the church doesn't make me saved, then what value was it to be raised in the church? And to that I would answer, because being raised in the church, I heard the gospel from a young age. And I heard the word of God from a young age. And I had truth presented to me. And I had the opportunity to follow Christ at a young age. That's a great value to me. But is it any value to me in salvation? No. And that's the same idea with the Jews. Okay? God did call them close. God did call them his people. God did pull them near. But that didn't save them. It gave them access and it gave them a great purpose to be the messenger of God's good news. That's kind of the, it's kind of like saying, you know, if, if uh, I signed up to be on an email list for seismic activity, I want to know when there's seismic activity, okay? And then when the earthquake comes, I go, well, because I signed up for the email, the, the earthquake needs to favor me. No. What is signing up for the, it, it just tells me when the earthquake's coming. So the Jews were on the email list, God, his witness came through the Jews. He, he gave them the word. Problem was, they killed the Messiah when he came, okay? So, so they kind of missed the point there. Now, the second question he's gonna interact with here is in verse three, and that is, what about God's faithfulness? So first they say, what about our Jewishness? Then they say, what about God's faithfulness? Here's the question, verse three. What if some were unfaithful? Meaning the Jews, and obviously they were, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? What's Paul getting at here? He's saying one of, one of the things that might be said about the gospel is that, well, if, if now, um, Paul, are you saying that God abandoned his covenant with Israel? Is that what you're saying? Are you saying that now that the Gentiles, now that the doors are open to the Gentiles and they're grafted in to the Jews, are you saying that now God isn't, Still for the Gentiles? Because that would seem to say that you're saying God isn't faithful. You see, see how they're kind of trying to work at that? Maybe, maybe you're saying, Paul, that God isn't really faithful because he somehow abandoned Israel. That's what I think Paul's trying to get at here. And what does Paul say? Verse 4, he says, by no means. Which is Paul speak for no, 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 no. No. Probably six no's like that. No, 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 no. He says, absolutely not. Okay. Let God be true though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. He's quoting Psalm 51, verse four there, which is the Psalm where David's confessing his sin to God. And he says, against you and you alone have I sinned. In other words, David's saying, God, you didn't make me do this. I chose to do this in his sin against Bathsheba. What Paul's answer is here, ultimately, as far as I can understand it, Paul is saying, look, just because Israel broke their end of the bargain, in no way means that God is not still faithful to his end. Now, there's, there's different covenants that God made with Israel. He made, and we don't have time to get into all this, but there's, there's the covenant God made with Abraham. But that wasn't a covenant of salvation. That was a covenant promising that through Abraham's loin would come a great people and that God would bless the world through his line. And that, that really did become fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And that was a covenant of grace. God made it with himself. Remember, he put Abraham to sleep and he made the covenant with himself. The covenant of Israel, the Mosaic covenant, Israel broke it. They were unfaithful to the covenant. And so the question is, though, is because, and what Paul's pointing out is because Israel was the cheating spouse, does that mean that God is going to break or annul the covenant that he made? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Just because Israel cheated on God over and over and over again, just read Hosea, 
doesn't in any way say that God is not still faithful to Israel. Now, theologians like to argue about this kind of stuff. How faithful is God still to Israel? You know, is the church replaced Israel? Is, is, is there still a place for Israel in the future? Uh, I'm not going to get into all that. I, I tend to believe that God is still going to do something because I read Romans and other passages. I think God's still going to do something with the people of Israel in the future. Uh, but they're not separate from the church. It'll be through Jesus and it'll be part of the church is, is kind of the idea there. I think what he's saying is God is still faithful to Israel even when Israel was faithless to God. He's still faithful because he is true. And everyone else is a liar. That's the real. You want to take one thing to the bank today. God is true. And everyone else is a liar. <laughs> okay. That, that's all you need to hear. Okay. Let God be true and everyone, everyone a liar. Um, now, the, the next question here that Paul interacts with is verse 5. And that is, how can grace produce righteousness? This is something that the, the Judaizers, the religious Jews, they really had this hard time with. Paul, you're talking about grace, grace, grace. And surely this grace is going to lead to all kinds of wickedness. Look at what he says in verse 5. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? Let me put this in my own words. It's like he's saying, if our badness serves to contrast good, God's goodness, then shouldn't God be praising us for our badness? It, it's, it's really... Circular reasoning is not really good reasoning. And that's why Paul says immediately after, he says, I speak in a human way. But these were the, con I want you to get this. These were the critiques that the, the audience that were rejecting the gospel, the Jewish audience, these were the critiques that they had for Paul. Paul, you're talking about this radical grace, people being able to save, be able, being able to be saved from all these different pagan walks of life. Aren't you saying that, that God is somehow endorsing unrighteousness? Of course not. He says in verse six, because he says, by no means, for then how could God judge the world? Okay, God is reacting to sin, and he's redeeming sin, uh, and he's pro uh, providentially using sin in a way to, to create good, but he's not causing sin, and that's why he can judge sin, because he's separate from sin and evil. Okay, now that's a whole rabbit trail. I'll be honest with you, I'm just, you know, I wish Paul had given more answers to some of these questions. To, I, was very, I was actually kind of like, man, Paul, could you have just spent? But he's going to later, okay? So if it feels like Paul is kind of bringing up a giant question, then he just kind of doesn't really interact with it. Romans 9 through 11 is where he's going to really interact with this whole sovereignty of God thing and the future for Israel and all you Bible nerds know what I'm talking about. Everybody else is just like, whatever, okay? Uh, but he's going to answer these questions more later. He's just kind of uh, bringing them up slightly here. Verse 7, but if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Same idea. You know, if, if God's righteousness is on display when I lie, then maybe I should just lie. This is just, it's just wrong thinking. In verse 8, we get really what, what the issue is that they have with Paul's gospel. Why not do evil that good may come? As, now he says this, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. That's Paul not mincing words here. In other words, Paul's saying, people are constantly condemning me, saying my gospel is actually going to produce unrighteousness. That my gospel is, is so grace-focused that no one's going to actually do the right thing. That's what he's saying people are accusing me of, slanderously, and he's like, their condemnation is just. God's going to deal with it. Now, let me just pause here for a moment because I think there's some relevance to us here. Uh, I think that the critique of legalistic-minded people against the idea of a grace-centered, gospel-centered, Jesus-centered culture is that if you preach radical grace, you're going to get raging sin. Have you ever heard that? And it's pragmatically, I understand why they think that way. In fact, I am a legalist by nature, and so are you. Okay? Grace is actually as, as unnatural as the moon to me. And I know this because I'm a parent. Legalism seems so effective, doesn't it? When my son or my daughters are doing something, some kind of behavior that I don't like, my immediate reaction is to go give them a consequence. I'm not against consequences, by the way. Um, but my immediate thing is to aim at the behavior rather than the heart. And I know why, because the heart's way down there. It's really hard to get at. I got to really, it takes a lot of work. This is actually why the Bible, the qualification of an elder is that they'd be a good parent. 
Because if you can't disciple your children's hearts, then you can't help people with their hearts. And it would be a whole lot easier to create a very, very um, sterilized religious environment here where all we do is just bludgeon people for their bad behavior than it would be to actually get up here and try to preach the gospel every week and sit in my office and interact with people's hearts. Because I'm just telling you, it's, it's so much harder. But at the end of the day, behavior modification is not actually what the gospel does. And so it's so much harder to sit down and go, okay, I'm gonna interact with what is wrong with the heart here. So the critique of the Jews at this day and the critique of religious people for all of time is that if you preach the gospel, this radical grace of God, that you are saved by grace alone through faith alone, that you preach that, people are just gonna go, send it up, man. That's what they say. And it makes sense. But it's wrong. It's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. I want to stop for a moment. I want to ask this question, and I'll do my best to answer it. You might, you probably have better answers than I do. But let me just give some thoughts. How does grace transform the heart in a way that legalism cannot? How does grace, and let me, let me give clarity, I mean God's grace. I don't mean man's grace. Okay? Giving people a break doesn't change their heart. But yet God's grace manifested through Jesus Christ, has this ability to change people's hearts. Have you ever seen it? I love it. I love it when people, especially non-Christians, are like, man, that person was like, they were like the worst person in town. All of a sudden, they're like the most amazing person in town. What happened? Not legalism. I'll tell you that much. Grace affected that person. Grace affects. So we need to stop and ask the question, how and why does grace transform the heart in a way that legalism cannot? Let me give you some thoughts. First of all, grace-motivated change starts with done and then creates a do. And this is why it, it, it's so effective at changing us because, because we actually go, oh, actually, I, I'm not trying to achieve anything here. It's already been achieved for me. And so now I want to respond to that done with a do. The other side of that coin is that self-motivated or legalistic change starts with a do and it never feels done. Okay, let me say that again, because I wrote this carefully. Grace-motivated change starts with a done, the finished work of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more I can do to add to what God has already provisionally given me. So I want to simply respond to it in worship. Whereas self-motivated change starts with a do, but it never feels like enough. Legalism is a hamster wheel. I always got to do more. There's always a little more that I got to do. I remember talking, this is super sad. We we're talking to uh, someone that was an elder at a church years ago. And outwardly, he was just this really spiritual guy. And, and, and he was doing all this ministry. I and mean, he was like Bible study every night of the week. Just like, man, this guy's like teaching the word. He's doing all this stuff. And we, we come to find out for years, he had been having like serial affairs, like all the while, like while he was doing ministry. It was really puzzling to me. Um, and he repented, and, and, and God really broke him in a healthy way, and he came to Christ uh, again and received more mercy and, and, and was transformed. I remember sitting across the table from him, and I said, how did you do that? How did you do that? And he said, it was easy. I just had to make sure that I was doing more good than I was committing sin. So he said, every time I would go have an affair or do something, I, I would have to go do a lot of good things to relieve my conscience so that I could feel like, well, my good is outpacing my bad. <laughs> and he saw the, the flaw in that. The problem is, is that you're never going to catch up. Not to mention that's just not how it works. Okay. The, the relief, the greatest relief in the world is when you stop and you go, I don't have to earn anything. It's all been earned for me. And now I get to do stuff for God because God has done everything for me. And you know how freeing that is? That's the, the yoke Jesus is talking about when he says, take my yoke upon you, my, my burden. He doesn't say there's no yoke. He doesn't say don't do anything. He doesn't say don't get anything done. He says, do stuff, but do it because I've done everything. And you're simply responding through faith and worship. That's the most relieving way to live in life. That we want to walk in righteousness, not because we're trying to earn God's favor, but because God's favor has already been given to us. It's so, there's so much freedom in that. Grace-motivated change spends God's resources, which never runs out. Self-motivated change spends my resources, which always runs out. And if you feel exhausted right now, 
there's a good chance it's because you're operating on your own resources rather than the riches of God's grace. If you feel like you have moments where you just go, I just don't feel like I have anything else to give. Stop spending your resources and start spending God's because he has eternal resources. This is an important one. Grace-motivated change originates in God. So it is as secure as God's existence in unchanging nature. Whereas self-motivated change originates in me. So it is as secure as my ability to maintain it. You see the difference? If I change me, that change is entirely beholden on my ability to maintain it. If God changes me, if it's God's grace at work in my heart, if it's me responding to his goodness, then, then that change is as secure as God himself is. Because he did it. Just take a deep breath. You are not God. Nothing could be more encouraging. You are not God. God is, in fact, God. And he just wants you to receive before you do. He wants your doing to be birthed out of your receiving. That's what a healthy heart looks like. A healthy heart is receiving blood flow. Self-righteousness clogs up the tubes, man. It keeps me from receiving from God. It makes me think I need to produce. What the gospel does is it, is it, it brings me to a place where I just constantly release constantly go like this and I go oh yeah it's not about me it's not what I can produce it's not what I am producing it's not what I have within me to give it's all him it's his resources God just channeled through me you know how relieving that is I think 99% of my stress in life is me choosing not to receive the grace of God and choosing to operate on my own strength anybody else with me on that okay so this is why grace needs to transform us. Now, this was Paul's message, and this will be Paul's message. But the legalistic self-righteous Jews, their critique was, no, 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 Paul, grace is not sufficient to transform lives. I beg to differ. But it's not just grace. It's grace in the hands of the Spirit of God, right? It's God's grace, the resource of God's grace, in the hands of the Holy Spirit to circumcise our heart and to bring us to a place where we can be changed and transformed. I really got to speed up here. Now, the second part of the text is uh, verse 9, and this is Paul's scriptural text proving their condemnation. What Paul's going to do now is, in case there's any shadow of a doubt that the Jews are still in need of Jesus Christ, because they are, they're just as in need of Jesus Christ as the Gentiles, in case there's any, any, any shadow of a doubt that these guys are still in need of the grace of Jesus Christ, he's going to use all these Old Testament scriptures that the Jews fully endorsed, and he's going to show them how God actually... Um, is, con is condemning them and they need Jesus Christ apart from him. Okay, so here, here it goes. And I'm just gonna go through this quickly. We don't have time to unpack all these. Starting in verse nine, he says, what then, are, the G are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. Okay, now again, he's saying, yes, you're better off in terms of the revelation that you've been given, but you're not any better off in terms of the salvation, Okay. For we have already ch charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. And when he says under sin, note it, he's talking both about the, um, he's talking both about the penalty of sin and the agency of sin. So apart from Christ, we are both under sin's penalty and we're under sin's power. And listen to me, the gospel frees you from both of those realities. The gospel both pays you, pays your debt for sin's penalty, and it frees you from sin's power by giving you the spirit of God, by being born again, okay? Both those things. So when he says all are under sin, he means sin is the disease of humanity. Humanity has a terminal illness, and it is sin, and it is both causing humanity to be before a righteous and wrathful God who will judge, and it's causing humanity to be unable to free itself, and the gospel is the only answer to being removed from sin. Verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. He's quoting the psalmist in that. Verse 11, no one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Guys, what, what do you think? I mean, like, are people good by nature? 
Can you really believe that if you believe the Bible? Now, I'm not saying there's no good people. And this isn't saying there's no good people. This is saying there's only good people because God has allowed his goodness to be manifested in those people. What if the world, or what would the world look like if God completely removed his hand, his people, and his restraints from evil? What would it look like? It would look pretty bad. Do you realize that all the goodness that we see, even in the lost, we still see the goodness of God in the lost, but it's God in the lost. God is constantly at work in this world. We see his goodness and the the residual uh, remnants of his goodness all over the world, but that doesn't mean that that originates in people. Okay? We have no goodness by nature. Goodness must be imported to us. No one understands on their own. We need to be, we need to have it revealed to us. Verse 12, they all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat, this is going to refer to the words of, the hum- of humanity. Their throat is an open grave. In other words, death pours out of our mouth. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps, that's a snake, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. God made us in his image. God is a God who creates life and death with the tongue. We have the ability to do the same, okay? We can damage people with our words, right? We absolutely can. And humanity, by default, does this. It says, 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. Look no further than Cain and Abel, the prototypical sin of humanity, okay? As soon as sin infiltrated humanity, the first thing that happens is Adam and Eve's son kills Adam and Eve's other son. Death is the result of sin, both at our hands and something that we realize, In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. It's hard to see that sometimes when we're living in a very curated environment. Fly from here over to one of the war zones in the world right now and see the rubble. That's the reality of where man will ultimately lead itself. We have no ability to create peace. We have no ability. I mean, haven't we seen that by now? How many people, you know, how how many presidents have promised that they're going to usher in peace. We are incapable of creating peace in this world apart from Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's trying. He's trying to just get them to go, look, file bankruptcy on this world. File bankruptcy on your religious pedigree. File bankruptcy on your Jewishness. File bankruptcy on your politics. File bankruptcy on your own supposed goodness. File bankruptcy on it all and put all your weight down on Jesus Christ because he's the only hope for this world and is the only hope for you. That's what Paul's trying to get them to see. Because these guys are in love with their Jewishness. They're in love with their pedigree. And they are self-righteous. And their heart is hard. He says in verse 18, and this is, I think, the, the most damning thing that he says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. He's talking to the Jews here. He's talking to all humanity, but he's also talking to the Jews. So Paul, to summarize, Paul uses scripture from memory. He pulls all these verses out of memory, and they're all over the place. You can trace them all out. To disassemble any notion of inherent righteousness or virtue for any human before God. That's what he does. Now, Paul's going to sum up here in verse 19. He's going to sum up not just our text for today, but he's going to sum up this whole section that we've been in, starting in in chapter 1, verse 18. Here's the whole idea. If you want to take 1, 18 through uh, chapter 3, 20, and you want to put it in one package, he sums it all up here in 19 and 20. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth, every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. This is Paul's point that he's been prosecuting all of these verses. All the world is accountable before God. And he is faithful and he is true and he is righteous. And man does not put God on trial. Well, they do, but they ought not to. Man is on trial. God is the judge. And our dilemma is that we are sinners by nature and by choice. What will solve this dilemma? What is the news that can break us free from this terrible situation that we find ourselves in under the power of sin? For by the works of the law, verse 20, no human being will be justified in his sight. 
since through the law comes knowledge of sin. In other words, there's nothing you can do to be squared with God. And the rules, all they do is just show you how unsquared with God you are. So Paul has led us to a point where we now must interface with the fact that apart from Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. That's his idea. That's, that's where he's trying to lead us. And, and next week, we will pick up there and start to talk about the good news <laughs> of the remedy for sin's curse. Now, let's just take a few minutes and let me try to give some, some application. Uh, again, the, 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 I think what Paul is doing here is he's putting his finger on the heart disease of self-righteous religion. And in, and in showing us the questions that the self-righteous were asking, he's exposing um, the heart disease that they were dealing with, this inability to receive the grace of God. So the question I want to answer quickly, which is three points, is how can we have a healthy, whole heart? If being a Jew, spiritually, is about having a heart circumcised by the Spirit, then how do we have that? It's probably one of the most important questions we could ask. How do I have a tender heart towards the Lord? How do I have a healthy spiritual heart? Let me give you three things, three tips for a healthy heart. First one, become favor finders. Favor finders. The more we begin to see that all of life is grace, the more in tune we are with reality. And we become healthier and we are made whole and our hearts are right before God. I really want to just encourage you guys this week to become investigators of the grace of God in every single part of your life. And I'm not just talking about the physical blessings, although those count too. Thanks for the parking space. God, you know, thanks that, I, that my legs worked this morning. God, yeah, th th this is grace. But there's so much more than that. The, the, the hard things, the, the, the seemingly bad things, there is grace behind every rock and under, behind every, in every crack and behind every rock, there is grace to be found. And the way that we become healthy believers is we become investigators of how God is being gracious to us in all things, through all things. He is so kind. The Jews stopped doing this and their hearts became unhealthy. They started to become entitled to the grace of God. So I want to encourage you, worship. Worship is actually the, the key to, to keeping us from becoming stiff. Worship is what keeps us malleable. Worship meaning I'm going to ascribe value and thanks to God where it is due. Because I am by nature, I'm so entitled. I just assume God's grace. The key to a healthy heart is to be favor finders. God, I just want to see your favor all over the place. And I'd rather, I'd rather assume something is God's favor where it isn't because more often than not, it is his favor. It's amazing how different the world looks when you stop looking at all the negative things and you start looking at the fact that everything that happens to me ultimately will be used by God for his good. He is using all things for my good to sanctify me, to grow me, to mature me. God's grace is in everything that happens. It's hard to see it sometimes, but you got to look for it. Number two, become, this is, sounds so cheesy, but I wanted you guys to be able to remember it. Become blunder boasters. Not blender boasters, okay? You're like, I got a Vitamix. What's up? Blender boasters. No, okay. That was stupid. Uh, blunder boasters, okay? Bl blunder boasters. What I mean by that, <laughs> what I mean by that is, is be the first one in the room to admit that you're not God. Be the first one in the room to point out. I'm not talking about self-deprecation. I'm talking about what Paul was talking about when he says, I will boast in my weakness. There is freedom in admitting that you are not God. There is freedom in admitting that you are 100% a recipient of grace, that you have not in any way earned God's favor. There's so much freedom in that. I'm not trying to pick on this guy, but I was watching this interview with Tim Walls, and I was watching him dance around this lie that he obviously told, and everybody knows that he told this lie about being in China when he wasn't there. Everybody knows it on both sides of the aisle. Everyone knows he lied, and he will not admit it. Well, I'm a knucklehead, you know, and I'm like, dude, just admit it. You'll be so free. I like want to pastor Tim Walls around, but you do just, just confess it, man. Just say it. You lied because you're insecure like we are. Because you wanted to sound important and sound like you know things and you were there. You lied. Okay, we all do it, dude. Now receive the forgiveness of Christ. You just can't do it. 
Christians should be the first ones to our knees, the first ones to admit our need for grace. This is how God created the system of religion within the Jews. The temple sat at the middle of their everyday life. They came and they brought sacrifices and they came to the priesthood so that they constantly could be reminded of their need for grace. Man, I need to admit multiple times through the day when I fail. And not just, oh, I'm a knucklehead, but like, no, dude, I intentionally sinned right there. (laughs) I, I actually did something evil right there. I need to say that. And as a Christian, I have the bank account to be able to do that because I'm forgiven. You want to live life stressed out? Live life just pretending like you never make mistakes. Okay? The the life of a Christian is a life of confession. We breathe in the grace of God and we breathe out the sin of man. Well, you got to breathe it out constantly. And you can't breathe in until you breathe out. If you're having a hard time believing the grace of God for yourself, it's, it's probably because you're not breathing out through repentance. It's probably because you're not giving God, trusting God with your shortcomings. When we confess our sins, it's actually trusting that God is going to forgive us. And you never will f- confess your sins until you truly believe that you are accepted in Christ. The lower we go, the more grace we find and the more freedom we walk in. Number three, become self-sifters. Favor finders, blunder boasters, and self-sifters. What do I mean by that? One of the greatest overcorrections of self-love generation is the inability to separate my feelings from reality. I think this is one of the greatest diseases of our day is that people cannot separate my feelings from reality. If I feel this way, it must be reality. Christians do not operate this way. Christians, we recognize that we have feelings, but what do we do with them? We sift them. We sift them and we hold them before the objective reality of God's truth. And we realize that at times we must say to ourselves what Paul just said to his supposed audience, I'm thinking like a man here. <laughs> the moment that we're accusing God of being unrighteous and us as being righteous, we need to stop and go, I, this, is, this is human thinking. Sift your feelings. Sift the things that come from self. Let God be true and every man a liar. Continue to hold on to your mooring lines that he is, in fact, true. He is true and I am not. Submit your feelings to God's revealings about himself. So, our desire as Christians is to be wholehearted. Okay? And wholehearted looks like constantly receiving the grace of God. Now, whether you realize it or not, you're receiving it. As Christians, though, what we need to do is we need to start to see this constant supply of God's grace in our life. Not just to save us, but to sanctify us, to rescue us. That's why worship is at the center of the Christian experience. God is trying to grow us all up to be worshipers to a greater degree. Worship means just recognizing the grace of God and then giving him praise back for it. So that's how we're gonna end our time together. So why don't you guys come back up while I pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this bad news because this bad news helps us to see the good news. It helps us to see, God, that you have made a way for us to be rescued. God, I'm so thankful for Romans and what it's doing to my heart and my soul. It's causing me and forcing me to see just how much I look to what I do to justify me rather than what you've done. So God, I pray for our church right now. I pray as we, as, we, as we stand, as we sing this song, Lord, would you give us the freedom of worship? God, we just wanna thank you for all the grace that you've lavished upon us. So much grace, God. So much goodness. Lord, you've been so kind to us. We're so thankful for that, Father. So Lord, we love you. We sing to you in Jesus' name. Why don't you guys stand?